it's my pleasure to introduce the panel on implications for healthcare business research and art. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Chris Longhurst joining us uh, via Zoom. Uh, Dr. Longhurst is the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Digital Officer of UC San Diego Health. Uh, we have Tiffany Amariuta Bartel, who is a professor in HDSI in the School of Medicine. Uh, Vincent Nyes, who is a or sorry, Robert Toomey, who is a, uh, pr a professor at the Johnny Carson Center for Emerging Media Arts at University of Nebraska. And then uh, Vincent Nyes, who is a professor uh, and associate dean of academic program in the Rady School of Management. Uh, so uh, I'd like to start with a question for, uh, for you, Dr. Longhurst. Um, so the latest public version of GPT, GPT-4, uh, has famously done very well on professional exams, including the bar exam and the US medical licensing exam. Uh, and this has led to provocative headlines such as, can ChatGPT be a doctor? So my question is, can ChatGPT be a doctor? <laughs> it, it's really uh, an exciting time. You know, I'm a cautious optimist and we've been implementing electronic health records and other digital health tools for 20 years. And so we really have a preponderance of digitally available data about both patient care and how we deliver patient care that is exciting to think about how we can use with these tools. At the same time, this is a high risk environment. You know, we're caring for patients and uh, sometimes hold their very lives in our hands. And so we have to be very thoughtful and measured in terms of how we implement these things. And so um, as an example, just this week, we were announced as one of the first partners in the country uh, with our electronic health record vendor, uh, Epic, who is built, of course, on the Microsoft stack. And so we have uh, operationalized GPT inside of our electronic health record for a very specific use case. And so I'll just share this slide for a second. But the, the use case is very specific, which is we've become overwhelmed with messages from patients, uh, particularly since the pandemic, as we've delivered more and more virtual care, our patients contact us for asynchronous questions. And of course, our clinicians uh, don't have time set in their schedules to uh, respond for uh, all these messages. And so the use case specifically is that we're going to, or we are using GPT now to help draft messages that our uh, clinicians can then edit before they send. So that helps to address a couple of issues. You know, one is uh, our previous speaker was talking about the errors GPT can make when it hallucinates. We don't want any hallucinations going directly to our patients. And so the editing of course is critical. Uh, the second is that, um, uh, our clinicians know their patients in ways that our uh, systems won't always have the data that suggest. And so um, our clinicians will be able to edit the tone of those messages to make sure it's appropriate for those uh, individual um, patients. And then finally, we always want to test things really thoroughly and in a rigorous and disciplined way before we turn them on kind of writ large. And so we're working with a group of primary care physicians that are part of the pilot. We're uh, measuring both quantitative and qualitative feedback to make sure that uh, this is both improving patient care, response times, clinician satisfaction, and patient satisfaction. And so uh, we'll learn more over the coming uh, days. So again, I, I'm bullish and cautiously optimistic, but we have to be careful and measured in our implementations. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, so I want to go to Vincent now. Um, so we've seen how ChatGPT is an excellent uh, chameleon of sorts in that you can say, write an email in the style of Shakespeare and, and it, it'll do that. Um, so it, it can tailor, it can generate text tailored to a specific audience or purpose. So how do you foresee this changing marketing and, and advertisement? Well, so David had a, had a good example about the, uh, the ad agency that was going to use um, ChatGPT uh, to generate ad copy and then have uh, the copy editors be literally editors. Uh, and I see that as a, a famous example already of Stitch Fix. So Stitch Fix uh, is a customized uh, fashion company and they uh, are doing something very similar which is for their ad copy, they're having it being generated by, uh, by AI and then the copy editors editing. They do the same thing with product descriptions. So there are many thousands of product descriptions they have on their site and they need to be carefully edited to be consistent with the brand message and the values of the company. And so they now have that generated by AI, again, edited by, by the editor. So there will be significant implications for uh, the number of people that they need to employ as copy, copy editors. Um, I think it's not just marketing, obviously. Uh, if you think about uh, finance, if you think about business analytics and data scientists and companies, all of them have an opportunity to be much more effective and efficient. Also have opportunities to expand beyond 
the skills that they usually uh, were using and the, and the technologies and tools that they were using. Uh, and ChatGPT makes that, makes that possible. Um, there are definitely going to be implications. I don't think we're anywhere near yet where it could literally take over an entire person's job, but it can take over tasks and it can uh, enhance the ability for people to do tasks more efficiently and more quickly. Uh, so I think there's, there's widespread uh, concern about the implication for the job market. I think there's going to be a lot of reshuffling of positions and, and changing of scope of positions. Again, I don't think it will replace a specific person, but I like this quote from somebody I follow on Twitter who said, uh, AI will not replace you, somebody using AI will. Uh, and I think that's incredibly likely. Robert, uh, this next question is for you. We've, we've mostly focused on GPT, which is a system for generating text, but uh, there are other models such as DALI for generating images, um, and soon, as David said, video. Um, so these models have rapidly grown in quality, and so I saw just this last weekend um, it, the judges uh, at the Sony World Photography Awards awarded um, a prize to an AI-generated image. They didn't know it was AI-generated. Um, so this has raised concerns about the place of AI in, in the arts. Uh, do you see generative AI um, and the creative arts as necessarily being at odds, um, or is there a place for AI in, in art? Um, and can AI-generated art be considered authentic, in a sense? Yeah, so I think, uh, so I'm speaking from the perspective of a practicing artist, uh, working with emerging technologies, and also a researcher who's kind of building some of those technologies. Um, I, think, I think the first part of that, sort of like, are AI and art at odds? First, I just want to say, I think these contemporary, like, you know, large language model or, or you know, deep learning based generative techniques are just kind of the last point in a long arc of technologies that artists have engaged with or emerging technologies. Oil painting was at one point an emerging technology that allowed for like a more, you know, persuasive representation of light, of flame, of transparency. Um, same with photography, you know, some, in some sense was an, an emerging technology that replaced like painting, drawing, other kinds of traditional representation. So we see this again and again, and I'd say that the tools that are available now are in some ways just a continuation of kind of being the latest emerging technology that artists will you know, readily and happily adopt. Um, I think the more complicated question, though, is, is like in, in what way are these tools different in kind from those other ones that I mentioned, like Photoshop, photography? Um, you know, to some extent, we're getting better tools, uh, kind of, but traditional, like with uh, Runway ML is a company in New York that you know, is manufacturing kind of web-based video editing tools that do things like background subtraction, depth of field, at a level that would, you know, take a lot of human labor to do. So it's kind of that idea of automation, maybe of menial work or things that um, David mentioned earlier. Um, so better tools are one thing that we're getting. Another thing I think really is like maybe new tools or new modes of interacting with tools. Um, I think, you know, we see, uh, thinking about these language generation models and then also about these text to, you know, text to image models, um, those are kind of intervening at the level of like concept or ideation or language, which is a different place for a computational tool to be for say a visual artist or a filmmaker than some of these other kind of like, you know, traditional technologies that are used in those practices. Um, I think also we have, you know, these things can play new roles in kind of giving visual form. I mean, you know, um, maybe back to the menial labor part, you know, uh, text image generation allows people who say can't draw or 3D render, you know, produce images to represent concepts. This can then be used for like storyboarding, ideation, you know, kind of like some phases of creative production across all kinds of fields. To come back to this idea of authenticity, I think that's a pretty loaded term in the arts, um, but one that artists love to think about. So, you know, authenticity could be, um, have to do with sort of, you know, in, in what ways do, do these tools facilitate like an authentic expression or exploration or critique? Um, harkens back to like Walter Benjamin and the idea of the aura, you know, the handmade that has some presence. So are the outputs of generative systems authentic? I think it depends on how you use them, right? Um, it also raises this question of attribution, though. So whose data were these tools trained on? You know, um, you know, whose style are we using as keywords to prompt images? Um, and also just like what biases exist or distributions you know, in the training data? Because those things you know, limit the space of what can be expressed with these sorts of tools. Um, 
and also raise all kinds of issues about you know, copyright kind of attribution, you know, creative work. I think I'll leave it there, but just that you know, I think um, you know, as, as a visual artist, I might criticize the outputs of some of these like, text to image systems and things like Dolly. Actually, I wanted to see who has used like, Dolly, Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion. OK, try them out. You can also find those online. Um, but I'll say, uh, you know, as an artist, sometimes I might criticize these as, as you know, wonder if they're a normative influence. Are we just kind of reproducing cliches, recognizable styles, you know, trademark styles by artists? So I think, um, yeah, I don't know. That's, a, that's an, an open question here. Sort of do they expand the creative possibilities, or are they sort of reinforcing existing patterns, methods, tools? Yeah, interesting. I, I think um, a quick follow-up. I mean, I've, I've seen ChatGPT called a blur tool for the internet or a blurry JPEG of the internet. Is, it a, <laughs> or, or is Dali a blurry JPEG of art? <laughs> Yeah, and what art? I mean, there's so many different art worlds, right? Like a lot of a lot of images were scraped from like I forget like Deviant Art or something like these kind of like online, you know, bulletin board style posting things. So like that's one art world. There's like the art world of historic European paintings. You know, there's so many art worlds, experimental video. So it's it's blurry. Yeah, that Ted Chang article is ChatGPT a blurry JPEG of the internet. You know, um, there's so many kinds. I guess it's. Yeah, I don't know. There's so many. It, it's hard to imagine a totally inclusive system that could capture those nuances of like style and origin. All right. All right. Thanks. Um, so, Tiffany, next question for you. Uh, so, uh, we've seen that uh, large language models are models for predicting, at the simplest level, the next word in a sentence. And and so you work in genomics, and genomic data is in a sense text. Mm -hmm. um, it's a sequence of G's, C's, T's, and A's. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if um, the underlying technology of large language models has been put to use in genomics for maybe predicting the next gene in a sequence. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Um, this is a great question. So actually, for quite a long time, uh, these LLMs have been used in genomics. And there's a few examples, uh, at least one of which I'll give today that a lot of you have probably heard of. But first, I just want to lay the groundwork for why applying large language models to genomics is actually much more complicated than applying it to human text. Um, and so, for example, the sentences of, of human language, you know, we have words. They are um, units that, and building blocks that we can work with. DNA sequence, on the other hand, is three billion base pairs with no spaces in between. Um, and so at the level of regulatory elements and enhancers, you know, us as scientists, we still don't have a good idea where these start and end. A lot of them are also context specific, and we don't really know all of their functions. Um, aside from that, there's all these higher order interactions between not only proximal spaces in the genome, but very distal. Um, connections. Um, and so that makes it even a harder search space to, to deal with. Um, but one example, and, and possibly based on this description that I just gave, um, uh, making the jump from DNA sequence to amino acid combinations, which is much more similar to words in a sentence. Um, so LLMs have been used um, for protein folding. So a lot of you have probably heard of OpenFold or DeepMind. Um, and this is a, effectively a model where the input is an amino acid sequence, and the prediction is a full 3D atomic resolution image of the protein. Um, and this is incredibly useful because you need this for when you're um, working on drug discovery. You have to have a very high resolution image, a concept of exactly where every single atom in that structure is located in order to understand the binding dynamics, like what that drug might do, like in vivo, things like that. Um, and often, experimentally, when you um, try to generate this image, not from an AI-based model, um, you can get a blurry image. And so uh, actually, like these um, models that have been trained and applied, uh, trained on millions and millions of sequences and have predicted many, many um, uh, 3D protein folds have been highly accurate. And also, you know, they, they save all the laborious um, experimental effort that, um, for, so just uh, pointing back to what, what David was mentioning, this is a perfect example of where um, you can automate something that gets near experimental accuracy um, and is also has a lot of healthcare implications. Um, aside from that, um, more recently there was a preprint on BioArchive about predicting the next COVID-19 variant using large language models. Um, and this is just a preprint, but still, um, so I just keep that in mind. Um, so it was based off of a collaboration between NVIDIA and uh, researchers at uh, UChicago and Argonne. Um, and so it's really interesting because uh, you can also use large language models for modeling evolutionary trajectories in genomics. Um, and you can use that to predict 
where is the next mutation going to be? And it might not just be in the spike protein. Um, and so this is uh, really helpful information that can um, accelerate the um, development of vaccines or also just like have it ready uh, you know, in our back pocket for, for when these new variants do arise. Um, and sort of looking toward the future, I'm excited to see if large language models will be able to do this task that I think a lot of experimentalists would be really thankful for. So for example, um, if I asked ChatGPT, can you generate me a DNA sequence that has a specific functional effect, that would be excellent. Because then you could um, do, you have a very controlled experiment. You could, you know, design all of these uh, sequences that you can transfect cells with and, and observe if the, the, um, you know, the functional effect that could be important for disease. Um, and so I, I hope that that's where the future is going, um, and we can automate that process. Yeah, I, I, I think what unfortunately comes to mind. I think um, David mentioned the scale of of bad actions that large language models open up. And so we could imagine a large language model being used to develop new vaccines or, or a DNA sequence that has a particular function, but um, those might not be good, good functions, right? So do you see a danger there? Absolutely, definitely see a danger there. Um, <laughs> there's a, a, um, just from, um, I guess, like a standpoint of also privacy, and I, I feel like there have been a lot of maybe high media coverage stories about, you know, uh, generating um, uh, either viral sequences or other sorts of sequences that, you know, could, could essentially qualify as um, uh, biological warfare. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> no, and I, 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 not to sort of like uh, put too much emphasis on it, or um, but, uh, yeah, there are examples out there, and so there's a lot of uh, careful regulation that has to to be um, accounted for because you could literally order whatever sequence you want and then unleash sort of um, you know right. very damaging <laughs> yeah. effect. Um, Dr. Longhurst, I'd like to go back back to you for the next question. Um, so, on one hand, ChatGPT seems to offer upside. So uh, it offers patients the ability to access uh, medical uh, advice, low cost medical advice. Uh, at all hours of the day, which I think you were referring to earlier. But at the same time, there are clear and obvious dangers, especially given that it tends to hallucinate uh, and make things up. Okay, um, But given the trade-off, what do you see as the role of ChatGPT in between the doctor and the patient? Yeah, that's a great question. And we've seen a lot of uh, examples of uh, hallucination of GPT, even in uh, uh, healthcare settings, which is you know obviously concerning. So. I mentioned previously that the way that we're um, dipping our toes in the water at UC San Diego Health System is by using GPT to draft responses to patients that will then be reviewed and edited by clinicians and members of the care team before that uh, gets sent. There was an article just published actually by uh, Dr. Peter Lee uh, from uh, Microsoft showing examples of uh, incorrect output by GPT. For example, uh, when asked, how'd you learn so much about metformin, a diabetes drug, uh, GPT says, well, I received a master's degree in public health and volunteered in diabetes clinics. Um, and uh, interestingly though, then GPT-4 can be used to validate itself, right? And it recognizes that uh, in fact, uh, GPT should not be answering in that way. So this is something we've been thinking about even prior to uh, the large language models. Uh, we've been working on uh, a variety of different AI and machine learning um, algorithms in our healthcare system. And so uh, imagine that if you uh, spoke with your doctor, would you rather have them in a situation where they didn't have confidence, make something up or say, I don't know and I'll get back to you? Well, certainly we felt like the I don't know was the most appropriate approach. And so um, our team has actually uh, taught a sepsis prediction algorithm how to say I don't know in about 8 to 10 percent of cases where it doesn't have enough information to make a confident prediction. And so we've been testing this in production now for six to eight months. Uh, we're getting very positive results. And one of the things that we're hearing from our clinicians is the fact that the algorithm will say I don't know is actually increasing trust in the algorithm. And so, uh, you know, conversely, obviously, these large language models um, you know, hallucinating and just making up answers uh, is decreasing trust as well. Thanks. I, um, I want to go to Robert now for, for the next question. Um, so GPT is very good at imitation, as we've seen. Um, and uh, one of the striking applications of this that I've seen is um, you can, for instance, by, by giving a model and fine tuning it, uh, your text messages, maybe a text message conversation with someone, um, you can have it replicate that person and their way of speaking or yourself. 
I, I've actually seen people use this to uh, build an AI chatbot that imitates a deceased loved one, for instance, uh, which I think has uh, mind-bending implications. But your work is kind of in this area, the intersection of empathy and, and, uh, uh, and human-computer interaction. I'm curious what it can tell us about sort of the, the good and bad of that sort of application. Great, yeah. Um, yeah, noted chatbot conversant, Robert Toomey. Yeah, um, so, but yeah, um, I mean that, that, so I'd call this like all this realm of kind of imitation intimacy or desire for companionship or even beyond that, maybe a desire for like communion, some kind of like deeper, like meaningful connection to, to an other, human or non-human. Um, there's such a history in computing with this, right? Like back to the early days of programming, you know, Joseph Weizenbaum at um, MIT with Eliza, you know, this therapist, really simple therapist robot, you know, bot that he wrote, which got his employers and friends like um, uh, hooked, basically. And, and this totally threw him for a loop. Um, you know, you mentioned the Jessica simulation, or more recently, or also like Eugenia Kudia's Roman simulation, which replaced kind of a loved friend, uh, which has now turned into this company, Replica.ai, which their business model is really kind of creating custom chatbots that you can have ongoing relationships with. Um, so I'd say my question with this is always like, what are we interacting with when we interact with the model? You know, um, that these things construct like affect loops, you know, especially if you're talking about like deceased loved ones and things, you know, there, there's a kind of like com self-comforting or psychological self-stimulation that you're looking for um, from that interaction. I think also there's like an inherent theatricality to it that, that humans, you know, kind of like anthropomorphization, humans want to read intent, want to project like a coherent subject onto the thing they're conversing with, but it's all this kind of theater. You know, you've kind of loosely skinned something as a certain kind of character. Um, and so it's really like a space for projection. So yeah, I guess like, you know, thinking about risks and rewards, I think on the, on the upside, um, upsides or possible applications, you know, um, loneliness is a thing and has real health consequences. Um, so I think ideas of bots that could provide some kinds of companionship, you know, could, could be, could, can be a wonderful thing. Um, Maybe also to some extent, maybe this problem of like hallucinations or truthfulness don't matter as much in some kinds of casual conversation or some kinds of interactions. Although you wouldn't want like a companion bot to go off the rails. Um, I definitely think these things can serve some psychological needs. And the question for me is, you know, I think the clinician on the call, you know, some others might have more informed opinions, but you know, there's a there's a company called Wobot making kind of a therapist bot, like, uh, you know. It can maybe serve some need, but do we, can it have a clinical or therapeutic use? You know, I think in the world of arts, like we welcome the hallucinations. Maybe it's just about the affect and kind of the interaction. Um, yeah, so maybe these things work best in kind of, you know, more performative or arts sort of frame. Interesting, thanks. Uh, so I want to open up the next questions to the committee, or, or to, the, to the panel. Um, academia. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's likely that the introduction of AI is going to change the nature of work in a lot of, uh, a lot of fields. Um, so what skills do you foresee becoming less important because of these generative AI models? And which skills do you see becoming more important, perhaps? Uh, so skills that are going to become more important, um, in some ways, maybe creativity uh, and the ability to go outside of your, your usual box. Um, I think of AI in some ways as you know, access to coding where now you would go and do a hello world. Now you can do something like that, but on steroids. So anybody that isn't even familiar with coding or maybe wants to, to try a new language, they can get started and build real things very quickly, which also has lots of risks if they open up their computer hard drive to things, for example, or, or networks. Uh, but I think there's lots of opportunities to expand outside of the box where you usually are, just because this makes it easier for you to get a step. And it's, it's also not judge, judgmental. Right? So if you make a mistake or you don't know, know something, uh, you're not maybe as afraid to ask for something, whereas this will just tell you that information. 
Um, all right, so for, for skills that we can probably, you know, uh, lessen our attention on, uh, aside from, you know, the, the, the easy ones like spell check and code checking, um, I was really trying to give ChatGPT the benefit of the doubt when I was thinking about this one. Um, and I realized that a lot of successful interdisciplinary science has been done by linking concepts such as, like, I'll give the example of, um, like, pre-2000s uh, computer science algorithms just in the last 10 years became really popular in genomics. Um, and so I was thinking across disciplines where, you know, me as a geneticist are, is not necessarily exposed to a, uh, concepts from other fields, um, this sort of AI could make inferences about what could be useful methodology across disciplines and could maybe accelerate um, our ability to apply other methods to new problems. Um, and I was thinking that maybe uh, uh, the you know instead of waiting for the time to pass to think of these um, natural connections, it could suggest them to us much quicker. Um, and then in terms of skills that could uh, that we still need to make sure that we are uh, top notch on, uh, critical thinking and interpretation are super important um, because I've just like David was mentioning earlier, I've had the same problems with ChatGPT about making up sources, making up uh, citations, papers that don't exist, um, trying to cite. Uh, authors who I had as previous co-workers and I knew that they hadn't researched those topics yet they you know ChatGPT said this is the conclusion from their paper and I, I, I said nope they've never researched that <laughs> um, and so just like letting making sure that we know um, how to use ChatGPT as a tool rather than like a, a, an, like a truth um, and so using it as a search, much like one learned how to use Wikipedia, one learned how to use Google, um, and let that be sort of the tip of the iceberg in your search on whatever question you're asking, um, and uh, following up with like actual sources and making sure that they're they're correct. Fantastic.